I'm going to present you here is a study that you have commissioned to GFAR on the prospects for development uh, assistance in agriculture and rural development in the context of the post-2015 um, development agenda. Um, this work was not supposed to be a new foresight exercise that was very clear in the terms of reference. So what we did was more an analysis of existing uh, sources of information, existing foresight works, and ongoing discussions uh, about uh, the future of development assistance, especially uh, in relation with the post-2015 uh, development agenda. <coughs> so, I'm not going to develop what uh, GFAR is. You can uh, go to our website and have more information. Um, but in terms of foresight, I'm in charge of uh, developing more foresights within uh, the platform, which is GFAR, uh, bringing together a lot of constituencies, including four uh, regional <coughs> organizations, international community, in the organizations from the international community, research centers, but also farmers organizations, private sector, so a multiplicity of, of stakeholders and constituents. So in terms of foresight, um, I am in charge of developing a forward-looking approach within that platform, which is not easy, but we are starting slowly. And um, there are three components in the, in the work that we are doing, and one of these components is uh, what we call here the forward-looking platform, which is uh, a platform of foresight practitioners from different sectors of the society, uh, not only research, but also from uh, um, private sector, from organizations, non-governmental organizations, having sharing the same ideas of uh, developing more foresight work and willing to exchange. Right? So this is the, the forward-thinking platform in reality who did this study. A couple of people from that platform uh, joined with me, so it's a collaborative action. It's not just a work that has been done by myself and I'm just the the presenting uh, person here, I'm the coordinator of this work, but I'm not the single author. Okay, uh, very briefly on the terms of reference, just for you to understand exactly what we were asked to do. Uh, we were asked to explore the, pro the, the future of development assistance, but in terms of exploration, not prediction. So we were trying to uh, understand what might happen in the future to development assistance and relate to that to donors and GDPFD. And we were also asked to do it in a way to trigger discussions and debates uh, in, this, uh, in this meeting and uh, within the platform. So, um, I'm presenting just the methodology here because it's the way I'm organizing this presentation also. So it's uh, also the table of contents of my presentation. Basically, we, we have used a system thinking approach combining two streams of uh, analysis. The first one was about the architecture of development assistance, uh, looking at the current changes, the potential disruptions, and how this would affect uh, on the future stakes for official development assistance. And similarly, uh, in parallel, uh, because this architecture is not, cannot be analyzed as a separate system, but is related also with potential transformation of the world as a whole, uh, we, we needed and we had to explore also global transformations, which we did by uh, analyzing more than 20 global foresight exercises about how the world might, tra might transform in the future, and relating those uh, foresight exercises, analyzing them, trying to clarify a bit what kind of different future worlds we might face, and, and analyzing how this global scenarios might affect the future stakes for ODA. So trying to make the connection in order to uh, bring to you a, collective, a reflection on collective action. And this is a system thinking um, because there is a missing arrow here, which is how this might go back to the highest level, following a little bit what Ben yesterday presented to us with this systemic approach where the global patterns are also shaped by micro micro behavior, that means the behavior of people individually. Um, I have to read my paper to use my glasses <laughs> to use this, I can't handle the microphone. Is it clear for you from the back of this? Of the, okay. Good, so let's go now to uh, some of the findings. Um, first, we analyzed and we identified uh, major uncertainties related to uh, the transformation of the architecture of global uh, of development assistance. Uh, those uncertainties, we, we try to um, present them according to four dimensions. So first, global and, uh, let's say, and related to the public action, 
are two uncertainties about whether the sustainable development objectives will be included in the post-2015 agenda and whether an inequality and rights-based approach will be also included in the post-2015 in the, in the post agenda. On, uh, at the global level, but more related with private uh, action, uh, there is a big uncertainty about the future trade and international uh, exchanges regulation. We will see how that will be uh, translated into future words later. Uh, we identified also through this literature review three other uncertainties that are related with the forms and the nature of political engagement and in particular um, the power of the non-governmental actors in the future. And related to that, to what extent these conditions will lead to a better access of uh, poor populations to technical technological breakthroughs on the one hand, but on the other hand, due to the expected development of data and data commons, who will control that? And then two other uncertainties related more closely to official development assistance is the direction of development aid. In the future, who will set the, who will set the direction for aid? And this is not independent, of course, from the occurrence now of private investments in development aid. And this is a systemic approach because all these things are connected. We cannot just handle and, and discuss one uncertainty in isolation separately from the others. And I just highlight, highlighted here a couple of interconnections just to show you how when we develop a system thinking approach, we can see concretely what it means in terms of turning those, this system thinking into actions and we will see that a little bit later. Now, I have just to tell you something. I'm not talking about the post-2015 agenda as 2014 objectives or 2015. We are taking here a 20 years period of, of thinking. We are, we are talking about much longer term. So this is really uh, a future thinking that is not supposed to uh, handle or bring uh, information on what will happen in 2014 and 2015, but looking at really a much, lo a much longer time frame. It's important uh, to mention that now we will see uh, why later. Now, second element of our analysis was we try to identify the major disruptions in, in official development assistance. And we at least we identified four disruptions, uh, five disruptions, but, but basically I am developing these four. First, shocks. Um, our world is facing more and more uh, frequent, unpredictable, and systemic shocks. Those are now considered in foresight as the key drivers for change. And usually people are talking about a world which is getting more globalized. But actually what we mean in the, with this, it is that our world is more and more interconnected. And what happens, a shock that happens at a scale in one place has impacts and effects at other scales and other places. Uh, this is a kind of involuntary scaling up, if I can say that. But this interconnection makes that those shocks which were basically in the past, let's, let's predict more predictable and, and easier to handle, are much more difficult now to handle because they are more frequent, more systemic, and, and more diverse. Second, um, we, we see the proliferation, oh, 10 minutes, okay, the proliferation of development actors uh, beyond the traditional structure of, of official development aid with the emergence of um, corporate uh, business involved in, in agricultural development, uh, philanthropic foundations, even sim simple citizens are, are now intervening in, in development. So there is a change of the structure of aid and the, uh, the place and the role of the official development assistance is changing. And this process leads also to a specialization of actors which is increasing the risk of governance in development assistance. New actors are willing to find new niche, if I can say that, uh, in order to, to exist in that development framework. And we can see, for example, that CSO would, would, would be willing much more to uh, be working on accountability. Business uh, companies will, will develop development model when they are successful. Um, and the risk in that is a cacophony of aid. Um, there is a risk also of the lack of accountability of some of the actors, like for example, um, the, uh, the philanthropic foundation, uh, or the instrumentalization of some actors by others. Uh, and all these things are constituting, constituting now this new world where, where disruptions might happen. And the question is whether the new SDGs will be a point of departure from a kind of business as usual approach and leading us to a different uh, future or whether these SDGs will be just a continuation of what we have done so far. And this is a, a major potential disruption of course. Now, 
Um, going to the second stream of work, um, we, let me go this way maybe, okay. Screening 24 site exercises, we were able to identify five different future worlds. I'm not going to develop them here, they are in the report that we have sent to you, um, but when we, after we did this, this, this analysis, we realized that those elements up there uh, are the three dimensions which helped us to, clarif to classify these five worlds. And they are quite important because they are very much related with yesterday's discussion on complexity. Um, the first dimension is the governance mode, is whether we are thinking the governance, the future governance in terms of local approaches or global approaches, opposing them together, or opposing them, or whether we will try to change our mindset and have a more polycentric approaches of multiple scales and combined approaches. The second uh, dimension of this is the development rationale, whether we will uh, work on in worlds that will be based on competition or based on collaboration. And the third one is how we frame problem. Simple problem can be addressed with through technological approaches, issue by issue, or we will have to deal, or we want to deal with wicked problems, uh, needing more resilient approaches, more intercom interconnected dimensions that, have, that will be handled in, in more complex ways. Now, if you combine those three dimensions in this 3D graph, and you plot the five, the five scenarios that we have identified, um, we have tried to see where we, where we are now. So this is where we are now. We have bits and pieces of each of these scenarios, but we have a significant part of the multipolar and the market forces scenario in our current world. The question is, with this 20-year perspective, when we will want to look back after that to the GTPRD, where can we go? So there is a direction which is just, you know, making a kind of business as usual, and we stay where we are, we just move like that. Um, however, when you look at the SDGs, um, there is, we have some kind of aspiration towards a kind of different world, with changes of value, with more, let's say, regulated market forces. So it's something that would bring us towards that direction. But at the same time, there are signs that we might very well uh, go towards uh, a direction that is not very much hoped, which is uh, a direction where we will have a world made of um, a myriad of enclaves uh, separated and working in isolation. Now, using this framework, uh, we try to find out what kind of strategy would be resilient when we are going back to agriculture, rural development, food security and nutrition. And basically, we identified four elements of a strategy, which are uh, the following one. First, linking specific and uh, local agriculture and rural development to the more global sustainable sustainability issues. Um, doing this through polycentric initiatives in order to ensure that development actions in a diversity of context contributes to reshape global agendas. So it's going from the, from the local to the global linking the local dimension to the global dimension. Second, addressing the needs of rural households beyond agriculture uh, and food production through measures that are ranging from the safety nets that we have already, we, we know already, um, uh, including adequate nutrition, health education programs, but also agricultural research and extension involving farmers in the business uh, along the value chains and promoting also non-agricultural employment and income generation in and on and off farm. So it's, it's a more comprehensive approach going beyond uh, the, vision, the traditional vision that we have of a farm being a place where we produce uh, agricultural products. Um, and then addressing also uh, all, simultaneously all components of sustainability. That means not only the environmental dimension but also the social justice dimension and, and the growth dimension. Um, and for that, there is a need uh, to build coalitions and act collectively, and I will come in to that in my last slide. So when we are now going back to the new or uh, the future stakes of, uh, for a renewed ODA, uh, what we've seen is that in terms of thematic focus, and I'm not talking here about whether we need to work on pastoralism or nutrition or, or land or water, but having a, a thematic focus that, is, that we link together uh, First, rethinking the global food security issue into a food insecurity problem at rural household level. Uh, but doing this at the same time uh, with uh, an idea of inserting this in, in, a in the rethought futures of rural areas, linking agriculture, growth, and rural development. 
taking into consideration, as it was mentioned yesterday, that policies and societal values are the drivers of those transformations, locally, globally, of course, but also locally, and with the objectives of the objective of increasing the resilience and the sustainability of farming system, not just the total productivity of the farms. In terms of processes, what donors and what official development assistance has to probably think about is to rethink the financing mechanisms uh, in order to be more flexible and to deal with those uncertainties in a systemic way. That means probably less centralized bureaucratic control of aid, more transparency, more direct effective channels, but those are have to be tailored in order to support a diversity of development forms, not just a one-size-fits-all approach of, of, of development or initiatives. And for that, there will be a need to build multi-stakeholder uh, coalitions of state and non-state actors, but not only at the global level in order to address global shocks how we are, as, we are doing, as, as we are doing now, but also at various scales, including cross-scale uh, coalitions, which means that the scaling of problem is not just a matter of starting local and going global, it's, it's something that might be even not relevant anymore, it's just if you have coalitions that are already integrating different scales, you don't need to think about a, a, a techni technique uh, in order to scale up. I'm a bit provocative here, I know, but still it's my job. So, my two concluding slides. My concluding slides are in fact two questions to you. If we really want to go in that direction, it means that we have to change, and I'm not talking just for, 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 for today or tomorrow or, or this year, but we have to, to engage in a journey uh, changing the way we handle problems uh, from uh, competing approaches across programs or donors, uh, looking at issues on a single technological basis, if I can say that, uh, and, and trying to figure out how we can solve problems locally and then how can we can send them globally. So moving from that posture of mind towards a posture of mind where we will have, through more collaborative approach, um, a way to combine different scales and handling the sweet problems that we are facing and, and which are the reality there outside. So for the platform, um, in well, for, for donors in general and also for, plat for the platform, um, there is a question about whether it's time now for more collective action in, in development assistance. And uh, in the paper that we have sent to you, uh, we suggest uh, that collective action can take several forms. And, and if we go from, uh, let's say, the, basic, the basis of collective actions, which is what usually donors do, uh, is sharing information, raising awareness, uh, doing some advocacy. But then you can, you can move to the coordination of programs in order to reduce redundancy, duplication, or even, and avoid conflicting messages. Then you can go away uh, to the harmonization of programs, meaning that um, you will have a common objective to which different programs can contribute. But then you got, there is another level of collaborative action, which is defining together the objectives and, and, and working together to make those objectives happening by combining your resources into collective programs, not individual programs aggregated through harmonization. And the final level is, is build little larger coalitions <coughs> in order to sustain on a long-term basis this kind of action. So not anymore a, pro, a joint program approach, but a joint coalition approach for a better future. So the question here is, to you, is, isn't that maybe a, a, a future added value for the platform to contribute to that transformation uh, of the donor approach towards more collective action? And I know that it's not easy, I know this is not something for today because you have your bosses who want results immediately, but reminding what, what uh, Ben said yesterday, uh, it's starting with the micro behavior that we can, we can engender uh, micro patterns changes. So I'm concluding my presentation here. In the paper that we sent to you, we went even a, a one step further. Um, we propose for your reflection um, some transformation of the GDPRD, not as a predictive approach, but kind of exploratory approach of my, what the GDPRD might become in 20, 25 years, according to the five different scenarios, the world orders that have presented. And that was just uh, la cerise sur le gâteau, if I can say that, uh, just for you to steer even more debates in the future. Thank you very much. I want to tell Robin that I, I like what he's proposing, and this kind of tool and any other tool fits within a scaling up agenda.
<laughs> if, you have, if you have your networks, that would be a pathway to scaling up, but there are other pathways. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, paper. And, you know, when I was looking at your, your pyramid, and then, I mean, at, at the top one, building larger coalitions beyond OEA, I mean, th that's not you, that's what we are trying to do already. I mean, from the Commission, we have, you know, a, a, a stream, you know, and a real push from, from our management to look at blending of loans and grants. I think you know this really needs much more attention. I hope that you know more thinking can go into it because it's a struggle to do it in the agricultural sector and particularly in smallholder farmers and how to how to use it. So I'm really pleased with the study, and uh, I think you know in particular the two top parts of your uh, pyramid uh, needs further attention. Thank you. In terms of the risks, um, so, I mean, there's one thing that, that bothers me in general uh, about the post-2015 framework is, is the idea of making it more comprehensive and global and bringing in uh, the different sorts of issues. I mean, I think the approach that you've talked about of, of, of linking specific um, and local agriculture and household issues to global issues is, is absolutely right and addressing the needs of rural households, all of those things. But um, you know, in the MDGs, we weren't very good at doing that. You know, you have uh, um, we we all hear that you know on aggregate we, the poverty reduction target has been achieved. But actually, what you've had is good progress in a relatively small number of mostly middle-income countries, and in a lot of the rest of the countries, things have stood pretty much still, and the needs of rural households haven't been met. So it so it didn't work in the MDGs in a sense. And now, although we see the logic of getting more comprehensive and dealing with sustainability and bringing in more issues like climate, environmental sustainability, governance, um, other important issues, actually we're expanding the agenda, aren't we? Um, uh, and in a sense, um, you know, national governments who will, who will be delivering, it's national and subnational governments who will be delivering on this, and donors indeed who will be trying to deliver on it, You've got a bigger menu, you've got a, a bigger selection of things that might be priorities and, and, and that you might do. And even with the MDGs, which was a more contained agenda, we didn't do very well in managing progress uh, on that. You know, we, we reviewed the MDGs every five years and we saw all of this inequality in performance. And we, we never actually really managed to do anything about it. When you're talking about aid, you were talking about, you know, visioning ODA. I mean, one of the problems about aid is how you allocate it and how you manage your allocation. You know, and even now, in the face of all that inequality that we've seen in performance on the aid and the Gs, there's a secular shift of ODA away from poorer countries and to, to, to middle-income countries that's growing and accelerating at the moment. And that, I think, um, is a risk. And actually, as we go forward beyond, uh, you know, after we have the goals in place, in, in 2015 and we think about implementing, I think the major problem we're going to find is, is how do we resource uh, the delivery of goals that achieves balanced outcomes across the goals and, 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 and for all of the different target groups um, uh, that, that we're supposed to achieve. And we don't have that mechanism really for, I mean, only, you know, how, how do we link um, our review and adjustment and adaptation of allocations to uh, the changes in need, uh, or the lack of change in need, indeed, and, and, and the lack of progress in some areas. So how do you think you can manage the process? How can, how can the, the new framework be better in terms of the way it manages uh, its implementation, and its delivery, its resource allocation uh, between 2015 and 2030? Thanks. Small question. I like the fact in the, this inverted pyramid, let's say, that you've, uh, you've actually foreseen uh, beyond ODA. And I think that's an important issue, and I think that time is going to come uh, very quickly that we are not talking about ODA anymore in a number of our institutions. We've already more or less set a time frame to that, with the exception of, let's say, a certain number of investments from the public sector in uh, fragile countries, fragile states. 
Um, I, I think that um, what I miss a little bit in this in this presentation is the um, the whole question of when Oda is being phased out, we 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 would be thinking of having a certain higher level of domestic investment in agriculture in our what we call now our partner countries. So I'm just wondering how we combine those two agendas. Uh, on the one hand, ODA. On the other hand, domestic investment. And also, let's say, the types of investment, the foreign direct investment through the private sector. So maybe you could just speak to that. Great, Robert, just, okay. just over five minutes. <laughs> okay. um, well, I, for your comment on scaling up, I, I think it has, has a comment. Thank you. I, I agree with you. I mean, I was just a bit provocative, of course. Um, um, here, I think there is a trap, which is we need to go from this level directly to that level. And uh, I think this is, uh, we, we shouldn't go too fast, because building this needs practices, needs trust, needs understanding, needs experience. And it's probably, I'm not saying that you have to go through all these processes, but to some extent, you can't build coalitions uh, or expect coalitions or alliance to work from the scratch if there is not some kind of, of community of practices that have been developed in order to, to, to bring some, some strong foundations to these coalitions or alliances. So uh, it really, it's, it's a process under which you, you, you have progressively to understand uh, and, and, and fight for this kind of, of things to happen, but I would say building it bricks by bricks and, and, and maybe starting from the top, from the, from, the, from, the, from the final objective of building these coalitions might be a bit risky. But I agree with you, this is where, I mean, probably where we have to go. Uh, now the question on, um, okay, on this, the, the future, I mean, the post-2015 uh, development agenda. Okay, of course, if I had the answer to your question, I would probably be the head or the chair of the high-level panel of experts on the, uh, on the sustainable development goals. Um, but still, your, your, your point is very, is very well taken. We, we want to make it more comprehensive. We want to have more comprehensive goals, including inequalities, etc. So it means that we want really to go, uh, can I go back here? We want to go somewhere here. This is, this is what the SDGs are, are targeting. The, but, yeah, the SDG are targeting. But currently we are here. So the question is, to what ex I mean, th there is a problem with the way we are thinking about the SDGs today. They are belonging to a world view which is not the current world we are living in. So the very big issue that you are raising is how can we be serious about uh, designing those objectives today without changing the world in which these objectives could be, could be put into a reality and, and being achieved. And for that, I think we have also to change uh, the perception that we have about uh, what the objectives, the future SDG objective will mean. Um, we have tried to deal with the uh, MDG, and this is probably why, why there are some failures in this, because we consider them as on a, on a, on a separate basis. Each, each objective has some kind of organizations in charge of making them happen. And in the future, we need to apply this famous complexity or system thinking approach to the, to the future SDGs, trying to understand better how they are interconnected. And recently, I sent some, some documents to, uh, to Nikita on, on how we could handle uh, a, a more comprehensive approach of the future SDGs, trying to understand by through which SDG we can make a, a difference and what would be the sequence of work. We can, there are more or less 12 SDGs that are considered today, uh, but not all of them are of equal importance, not all of them are equally interconnected to each other, and some of them are probably the entry points and others are more longer term objectives. But that, re that thinking has not been yet developed in the framework of, of the post-2015 agenda, and we, with the foresight groups, we are trying to, to make a contribution in that in order to make those objectives much more uh, understandable and, and more practical in terms of operational uh, activities at the, at the level of countries or even below the level of countries because if we look at 15 or 20 years ahead I'm not sure that the country level will be still the most relevant uh, point of action for development for, for uh, development actions and assistance and this is in, in some of these different worlds we have different options for that and I'm coming then to your to your comments 
Um, your question about uh, what would happen if uh, uh, ODA was uh, stepped out, uh, actually we, we consider that in different scenarios. The, the thing is that there, there would be reasons why ODA would, be, uh, would step out. And those reasons are not just linked to the architecture of, of development aid, but also to this, to this global scenario <coughs> and what is happening in this global scenario. So uh, I cannot answer very quickly to your, to your question, but in the document that you have received, uh, there is a discussion of what would be or could be the future of ODA in, under those different scenarios, including the possibility for ODA to, to, to step out, to disappear, and be replaced by something else. So I would encourage you to uh, look at those uh, possibilities and, and still interact with us. We'd be very happy to continue working with, yeah. with you, not for you, only, but with you as a platform, uh, as, the, as the GFAR, in collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to, to further develop this, this approach. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you.